let me introduce the panel. I'll start with, because my notes go this way, but it's not how people are sitting, Tiff Macklin. Tiff is the new dean of the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. Tiff and I worked together for many, many years. He was most recently in government, the senior deputy governor of the Bank of Canada. Uh, before that, he was a uh, associate deputy minister in the Department of Finance. Tiff, though, those don't know, is Tiff was our G20 deputy minister. He played one of the leading roles in the world during the financial crisis, and I think Canada really punched above its weight. Uh, partially because of our banking system working, but I think equally because of a regulatory system. And Tiff was our leader in that with the late Jim Flaherty. So Tiff actually brings a lot to his new role at Rotman and a lot to this conference. So we're looking forward to it. Ian um, Howcroft is the vice president, kind of the Ontario division, so kind of the right division for today of the Canadian Manufacturers and Exports. He and I share a degree at McMaster together. He's a lawyer. Uh, and as you all know, the Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters Association is one of our leading national organizations with manufacturers of both small, medium, and large. And again, I think what it uniquely does, a little bit like the Chamber, is brings together all sizes of business focused around the issue of how do we make manufacturing more competitive. And it is one of the challenges in Ontario. So Ian, we look forward to hearing from you. The Honorable Bob Ray, who all of you probably know is a, and the list goes on, lawyer, negotiator, mediator, arbitrary, with right now a focus on First Nations, Aboriginal and governance issues, particularly in the Ring of Fire working. Uh, he teaches at the University of Toronto uh, School of Governance. He's a widely respected writer and commentary. He's one of the folks I know that everybody looks forward to his op-eds in the Globe and Mail. Bob was elected 11 times to the House of Commons in the Ontario Legislature between 78 and 2013. He was Ontario's 21st Premier from 1990 to 1995 and served as the interim leader of the Liberal Party of Canada. Bob, thank you very much for taking the time. And Craig Wright. Craig is here. Uh, he's our Senior Vice President Chief Economist at the World Bank of Canada, also known as RBC. Craig is a member of the C.D. Howe Monetary Policy Council, Wilfrid Laurier kind of School of Business Advisory Council, the British Columbia Economic Forum Council, and he's actually one of the most widely uh, quoted economic commentators in the country. So ladies and gentlemen, your panel for today. So I'm gonna start because we're gonna be talking about the economy, so I thought why don't we start by asking Craig to do his three minute elevator pitch on the state of the Ontario economy. And I may not hold him to three minutes because I'm an economist, but I know Alan and his team will hold you to three minutes. So Craig, why don't you lead off and just give us a snapshot and then we have a baseline that we can use to talk about the Ontario and Canadian economy going up. Craig. All right, thank you, uh, Kevin. I'll, I'll do what I can to see to that uh, three minute timeline, but it's always dangerous giving economists a mic. In terms of the, the economic forecast, so I, I the, uh, uni the uh, Manitoba Finance surveys forecasts on a regular basis, so it's actually a pretty convenient exercise because they do it for all the provinces. And if you look at the latest survey, they're very similar in terms of what we saw in the, uh, the, the most recent budget and probably pretty close to what we'll see when we get the uh, fall statement out of Ontario and we'll be meeting with Minister Susan in the not too distant future to uh, discuss the forecast. So for Canada as a whole, uh, that the average of forecasters, these are the average numbers, they're not our numbers, but the average is 2.3. Uh, for this year and 2.6 for next year. So it's that uh, cyclical bounce, I think, that everyone's looking for, global growth in and around trend. We're looking at U.S. accelerating, and where it's accelerating is our most uh, important uh, sectors, so autos, housing, and the equipment and software investment. And then also a very low interest rate environment, as Kevin had suggested, and a more competitive currency, uh, arguably, to get more competitive as we move forward. So for Ontario, the, the relation to Canada continued sub-performance relative to Canadian average. So growth last year in Ontario, 1.3%. The consensus for this year is 2 and for next year, 2.4. So below Canadian average and a bit higher up the ranks uh, in 2013. Ontario was ranked seventh of all the provinces, and now in the next couple of years, consensus is for something in that three to, to four, fourth place ranking. So employment in and around 1%, the unemployment rate a little bit lower than this year's average, which is we're looking to be about 7.4, um, averaging next year at 7.1%, which is right where we were in September. So not a lot of progress on the unemployment rate. Uh, growth a little bit sub-potential, and uh, we've got 
two quarterly numbers now, first and second quarter. First quarter weather was 0.5 in Ontario, and second quarter bounced back to 3.5. So when you look at what's already booked for this year, it's just 1.3%, uh, which suggests that 2% for Ontario for the year is uh, well achievable and arguably some upside risk there. But a modest growth story, I think it's more uh, inconsistent with Kevin's interim. It's, uh, we look at it as a cyclical bounce in a structurally challenged uh, economy. Greg, thank you very much. And you hit the three minutes with time to spare. I'm impressed, actually. Every elevator pitch person in Canada should kind of uh, learn from you. Now, you heard Craig. Before I turn it to the panel, what I'd like to do is ask you folks, how many here, your business people, uh, think that next year is going to be a stronger growth year for Ontario and a better year for you and your business than this year? Show of hands. Better and worse. So it's an optimistic group. Okay, uh, that sounds a good basis for this conversation. Okay, so I'm gonna start, I've got a common question for all four panelists. And what I wanna ask them is, how do we, and this is picking up my structural uh, theme, is how do we get the structural economy kind of going again? I mean, we're, we seem to be nodding and thinking it's okay at 2.2 or 2.3. This was an economy for 30 odd years that grew close to 3%. And that's actually what generated the, li the living style and the business and educational communities that we have. So each of you, what do you think the three drivers that are most important in rebuilding growth in Ontario? What would you focus on? What do you think we should focus on? And it's not just what the government should focus on. What does Ontario, Team Ontario? And I'm going to start, Tiff, with you. And take about three to five minutes, please. Thank you, Kevin. Well, the glib answer to what are the three drivers building the Ontario economy is services, manufacturing, and commodities. Uh, but the, the serious point is we, in this country, from time to time, have a silly debate. Are we going to be a manufacturing-driven economy? Or are we going to be a service-driven <clears throat> economy? Or are we going to be a commodity-driven economy? And the answer is yes. Uh, we have <laughs> world-leading service uh, industries in this country, in this province. We have some very successful global manufacturing companies. We have. Uh, commodities the world wants, and not we, obviously we have those in northern Ontario. We also have the opportunity to be the supplier of choice to goods and services uh, to, un, to uh, commodity intensive areas like Alberta. So let's not try to choose between manufacturing services and commodities. Let's grow all three. Then the tougher question is, how do we do that? And you know, what is going to drive growth? And, and here I'm going to echo two themes you've already heard. Unfortunately, they're, they're not quick fixes. Uh, I would suggest that business and government need a concerted focus on two priorities that are really about a mind shift. And the first is pivoting from a North American mindset to a global mindset. And the second is developing a culture of entrepreneurialism and an innovate or perish mentality. Let me just say a word on each. We have been tremendously fortunate to be right next door to the richest, biggest market in the world. It's been great for Canada. It's been great for Ontario. We have hitched our trailer to the United States and combined with, with NAFTA and FTA, it's been a great ride. The U.S. is not the engine it once was. The center of economic gravity is shifting to rapidly growing emerging markets, particularly in Asia. And Canada is among the least exposed uh, countries to trade in rapidly growing emerging markets. Just a couple of numbers. Kevin said it, 75% of our trade in, in Canada goes to the United States. About another 10% goes to other slow growth advanced economies. Only 10% of our trade goes to rapidly growing emerging market economies. If you compare that to other countries, Germany, about 30% of their trade goes to rapidly growing emerging market economies. US, 40. Australia's over 50. In fact, if you compare us to other countries, we're among the least exposed. Uh, so I think it's pretty clear. We need to strengthen our links to fast growing, uh, fast growing emerging market economies. It's not easy. It's a long game. There are bumps. There are going to be bumps on the road. It is not for the faint of heart. But if you want to grow your sales, you've got to be where sales are growing. And this is going to require a more global mindset 
in business, in government, a better understanding of local markets, and, and one element I would stress is we need, we need to focus more on getting ourselves embedded in global supply chains. Then combine that with a culture of entrepreneurialism and an innovate or perish mentality. We have some very innovative Canadian companies that are competing on a global scale and winning, but we need more of them. If you look at our competitiveness, in 2000 we were ranked 7th in the world, today we're ranked 14th. There are a number of reasons for that, but the biggest gap is our innovation gap. The uh, World Economic Forum ranks us 27th in the world in innovation capacity. Public policy has actually done quite a bit in this space. Corporate taxes are low. There is generous support for R&D. What we need is more of a cultural, cultural shift towards entrepreneurialism. Simply put, we need more entrepreneurs. If you look at, if you can, among 21 OECD countries, Canada ranks 20th in the intensity of new business creation. If you look at the numbers, it's not about lack of ideas. We are very creative, uh, as measured by things like publications in academic journals. Where we lag is in, is in turning creative ideas into sales. Engineers, scientists, they want to build things. That needs to be combined with management expertise to turn that into sales. And that's where I think we need to do a better job. And you won't be surprised in my new role at the Rotman School of Management. This is something where I think, you know, you talked about Team Ontario. I think that's where we can work together as a team. Uh, then we need to accelerate that with management training, executive training. There are well-established approaches in how to manage innovation. We need, to, we need to learn those and we need to apply them. I'll just end on an optimistic note. I actually think there is a rare, rare opportunity to rapidly change culture. The, this new app world, these 25-year-old millionaires, multimillionaires, are changing, the, changing attitudes in society. Starting your own business is moving up the social ladder. And we need to make sure, as educators, that we're there to uh, fully take advantage of that. So, Kevin, what's going to grow the, Cana the Ontario economy? More new companies across all sectors and more high-growth companies that are expanding into rapidly growing emerging markets. Great. Thanks, Tiff. Bob, year three. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be back. I had the wonderful honor of co-chairing the first two uh, summits in 2004 and 5, and it's, it's great to be back in an even bigger venue with even more people. So thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me back after my uh, departure into the wild world of partisan politics, a strange return. Uh, but now I'm back to a more balanced life. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, I, it, since we've been told three things, let me, let me discuss three. Um, uh, the first is uh, a big shift to sustainability, and I take my hat off to Annette for her, her wonderful talk. I thought it was a terrific uh, introduction. In particular, uh, and again, it's a lot easier to be up here than to be in the premier seat, uh, having been in both places. This is, you know, this is a breeze giving advice for free. It's uh, wonderful. Uh, but I would, I would uh, do a big green shift in taxation. I would uh, really give a jolt to uh, a message to uh, Ontarians that we're serious about this shift and we are 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 going to uh, take the steps to send the signals to the market through the tax system and. Uh, I think it would be good for the province to do that. Uh, I think it would be uh, uh, a healthy message and something that needs to happen. The second is education. And I find it interesting that one group of people who are not here so much as, uh, as much as I think need to be here are uh, our primary and secondary school establishments. Uh, I think this is an area that needs a really hard look again. The average age of an apprenticeship in Germany is uh, somebody in their mid-teens. The average age of an apprenticeship in Ontario is somebody in their mid-twenties. Uh, we're taking a very long time to give people the skills that they need in the new economy. Uh, and the, the lead time to get through college and university is, is very long. And I think those institutions are ready to innovate in a major way. I think our school system needs to be ready to innovate in a major way. 
And I think it's, it's hard to do because there are very powerful establishments which are very, are not totally enthused on the subject of change. Uh, so we need to work hard at it. Uh, but I think it's a critical area that hasn't had a lot of uh, uh, necessarily public debate and examination. And I think there's a lot of things we need to put on the table uh, about how, um, how we can do more for students uh, and how we can provide more opportunities for adults uh, when we look at uh, the possibilities for educational change. Finally, uh, I do want to talk about inclusion. We are not, as a country, going to make uh, the major advances in the resource economy uh, unless we establish uh, a new partnership with the First Nations of the country. Uh, we have uh, thousands of people in the far north of this province living in, people say third world, I would say below third world, fourth world conditions. Conditions which are truly appalling. Uh, housing conditions which are terrible, uh, huge social problems, uh, people who've been excluded from the world of growth and, and development and entrepreneurship and prosperity. Uh, and now they're told that they're sitting on uh, all this wealth and the province wants to take advantage of it. And the First Nations are saying, well, what about us? Are, are we going to be part of this process or are we just going to be steamrollered and and told what to do and, and said, you know, and I think it's a really critical question. Uh, we're not going to unlock the wealth of Western Canada. We're not going to un unlock the wealth, the wealth of Northern Canada uh, unless we establish new partnerships. It's as simple as that. And it's going to require change on everyone's part. Uh, and it's, change is difficult and it's hard. The negotiations that I'm involved in are as difficult uh, and as involved and intricate and multi-party and complicated as anything I've ever been involved in. So I endorse totally what TIFF has, has said. I agree completely, having led multi-delegations to China when it wasn't particularly the thing to do 20 years ago. Uh, I think it's really important that we try to broaden the scope and, and, and uh, understanding of Canadian business. I agree about business formation totally. But we have to look at where we are in this province. If we want to unlock the wealth of this province, we have to include everyone. And that inclusion means the First Nations. And it means a new attitude on the part of government and on the part of business. And yes, it will require change on the part of First Nations as well. And as that starts to happen, we, I think we'll see the opportunities for, for growth but it's got to be inclusive because in the absence of inclusion, we're going to have conflict and we're going to have uh, a very slow tempo of uh, decision making and no one's going to like it. And I don't want to see the, this get caught up in the courts. I'd much rather see us be spending the money in productive and uh, creative ways to, uh, to, to, get, uh, to get things moving. Thanks, Bob. Ian, manufacturing is going through one of the big changes. What are the three drivers you think can bring uh, thank you. Growth. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, yeah, I think probably manufacturing has uh, been more impacted by the uh, recession five, six years ago than any other sector. Uh, we start with the premise that business as usual is not an option. We have to do things differently. Uh, we think uh, there's an image issue with regard to manufacturing. Many people look at it negatively. They don't encourage their children to consider manufacturing as a, as a future. Uh, so we're working, and we're working with uh, the Ontario government and others to try and raise uh, the debate around manufacturing makes sure people understand how important it is to the economy of Ontario and to the future economy of Ontario. We have a great campaign, the Good Things Grow in Ontario. I think we need a Good Things Made in Ontario campaign as well to celebrate the success of many companies out there. We have a lot of great small, medium-sized manufacturers, but as others have said, how do we get them to elevate them? How do we get them to be more entrepreneurial and take advantage of some of these global opportunities, particularly with regard to, to CETA? Uh, as I said, manufacturing has gone through enormous change. It's not what it was 10 years ago. It's not what it was even five years ago. Uh, we hear about the old economy, the new economy, the manufacturing economy, the service economy. We view it as one economy. It's inextricably linked. Uh, there's about 800,000 direct jobs in manufacturing in 2014. There's more service sector jobs that are dependent on manufacturing than there are actual manufacturing jobs. And we want to make sure people understand how important manufacturing is, not just take it for granted, elevate again the debate and discussions around building an economy for Ontario that includes, to take Bob's thing of inclusion, uh, includes ma manufacturing. 
Uh, global opportunities are, are there. We were very uh, involved and engaged in the CETA uh, with, with Europe, and we're pleased to help our members now take advantage of that. We're creating a, a European enterprise network here in Canada. Uh, we have recognized October as Manufacturing Month, again, to, uh, to raise the issues around that. We've also, uh, timely uh, this month, we've just released our, our manufacturing survey for, for our members. And uh, like the uh, crowd here, they're very optimistic. Uh, they think that they have a, a bright future. The vast majority see uh, growing sales and growing profitability over the next five years, which we're encouraged to see. But again, it's not something that we can take for granted. Uh, one of the key issues, one of the key challenges that we have to deal with, and it's not new and it won't be a surprise to people in this room, is the skills gap, the skills mismatch. We need to work to ensure that we have the competencies that businesses need, manufacturers need, if they're going to be successful. It's been around, discussed for 10, 20, probably 30 years, but we don't have the luxury of time on that anymore. Demographics being what they are, uh, there's going to be a huge exodus from the workforce, maybe not entirely, people may be working part-time, but we have to have the skills, the competencies there for companies to succeed. And that's the number one issue that our members identified in the survey two years ago, and it's even more of a problem, more of a challenge for them uh, with the results that we released this month. Uh, another challenge uh, that we uh, have I identified is the, uh, the regulatory burdens, and again, that's been uh, cited as well. Uh, we have to have a, a regulatory system and a regulatory process that allows us to protect health and safety, protect the environment, but do so in a way that makes sense and that we focus on, on the results that we need. So we have to address uh, regulations differently than we have in the past. Uh, we were very engaged in the Ontario government's Open for Business initiative. Uh, I think we had some significant success, but it also demonstrated how much more there is to do. We have to really work on getting that regulatory system uh, in, proper, in proper stead. Uh, it's not just one regulation, it's the cumulative impact. It's the unintended consequences. And what we're calling for is, is real consultation, where you have the opportunity to have an impact, to, uh, to steer the direction and the outcome and what the results of the regulations will be, rather than just a, uh, a, a monologue or a dialogue as to what decisions have already been made. So uh, I think there's huge opportunities on that. And uh, one of the other themes that I've heard talked about uh, this morning, and even in, in the hallway outside, is the need for partnerships. We have to work more closely and collaboratively if we're going to synergize the, uh, the resources that we have here in Ontario. And I think we can do that with regard to the educational system. We're working with colleges and universities and colleges in Ontario. Uh, we're working with other organizations and the government on the regulatory system. So I think there's a lot to be optimistic about. But these are real challenges and real barriers. Uh, the third area is rising input costs. So we have to be competitive, we have to deal with productivity issues, we have to embrace innovation, but we also have to deal with the rising input costs. And I guess the issue that we hear most about right now, particularly in Ontario, is energy, particularly electricity. So what can we do uh, to uh, reduce some of these costs? Uh, we're, we're promoting a variety of programs on, on conservation, on improved efficiency. Uh, we've had some success in working with the Ontario government to deal with the global adjustment mechanism, but the number one issue I hear with regard to costs over the last 12 months is, is, is electricity and energy in Ontario, and I don't think that's going to go away. I think that's going to intensify, maybe a bit of a reprieve on some energy costs right now, but electricity and the long-term uh, prospect for all energy costs is to go up significantly, so that's something we all have to deal with as well. Thanks, Ian. Craig. Thank you, Kevin. Um, just so... I'm an economist, so I try and keep it to the numbers. And the uh, the way we look at the, the speed limit, and Kevin had mentioned the, the new mediocre. We, we look at Ontario's speed limit. Used to be three percent. Now it's two percent, and that two percent is kind of made up evenly between uh, labor force growth and productivity. Labor force growth was two. Now it's one, and it's continuing to move, move lower in demographic challenged environment. And then productivity, we assume it's one and it's been running closer to zero. So if you look at the speed limit frontier, it's two now, 1% labor force, 1% productivity. Labor force growth is going to zero. Productivity has been zero, which suggests our speed limit's very low, which means we're not growing the economic pie, which is a very tight uh, market for businesses, means very uh, sluggish employment growth and also very tight government for or a very tight environment for government uh, revenues as they're driven off of nominal GDP growth. So to us, the, the best things to look at it: how to improve on labor force and how to improve productivity. 
And when you look at labor force growth, we've seen, we've heard a number of things. I like Bob's suggestion in terms of inclusion. If you look at First Nations, they tend to be a, a younger, on average, population than the rest of Canada. They also have a very low participation rate in the labor market, so there's, there's opportunities there. And we also have to look at globally and how competitive we are uh, for, for jobs around the globe, because the demographics is not just a Canada story, it's a global story. Everybody's competing for the best and brightest at the same time. So it's attracting and retaining. And then even within Canada, we've had 14 consecutive years of more people leaving Ontario to other provinces and coming to Ontario, getting offset from international migration flows, but maybe we can reverse some of those interprovincial flows um, and support labor force growth. So we will see, hopefully, some progress on that. On the productivity side, continue to see downward trend there. Um, there's lots we don't know about what drives productivity. Generally, what you see is any increase in investment tends to lead pickup in productivity growth. So looking at uh, any policy through the lens of what it does for investment opportunities and public sector policy maybe has some opportunities here in terms of uh, another round of accelerated capital cost allowance or uh, some investment tax credits. Corporates have a lot of cash. There's a great deal of uncertainty, but maybe a little policy tweak can uh, get some of that money put to work, which would be a good news story. And finally, that the institutional structure, if you will, for uh, or the business structure for Ontario continues to be a, a big challenge as it is for Canada. When you look at small, medium-sized firms in Canada, so these are under 500 employees, that's 99.9% .9 of firms in Canada have fewer than 500 employees. So all too often we look at policy and the impact on the economy through the lens of what it means for corporate Canada. We have to look at it in terms of what it does for small, medium-sized enterprises. And do we have the policies in place to help the small businesses that want to grow to grow? They tend to be less productive. They tend to be less uh, investment uh, heavy. And they also tend to be more focused on domestic markets rather than some of the growth uh, markets that uh, TIF and others have mentioned. So as we go forward, we have to help Help small, medium-sized businesses that want to go grow and look at policies that don't prohibit that growth because it will grow more Canadian champions, which is a good news story, and will also have the benefit of lifting productivity again, a much-needed uh, much lift. Great, thank you. So let me go back uh, another kind of brief round, and then I, uh, this is a warning, kind of want to then open it up to you. So start thinking about your questions. And let me go back and pick one of these areas. So we, you know, everybody talked about areas um, that we have to improve. Let's go back a little bit to what your suggestions for improvement are, because this is not just identifying problems. This is actually, hopefully, generating consensus on solutions. So let me try that. Bob, you raised the um, issue of you know, the German-Ontario comparison on dual vocational. So let me broaden it to you a little bit is, do we have the workforce for the future here in Ontario? And if not, what should we be doing to get closer to it? Well, I don't, I don't, I think, I don't think we do, because if we did, we wouldn't have the government of, the government of Canada rounding up construction workers and sending them back to Portugal after they've been here for 12 years and, and they've got families and kids in school and, and you know, you, you, you've got a law to enforce because they're here uh, without the proper papers and without having been admitted legally. Uh, but they're here and they're here because the work is, is here and because the, the people who are living here are not, are not moving into those jobs. And so you've got to ask yourself the question, how do we, a, how do we make sure our immigration system is set up in such a way that it's much more focused on what the labor force needs are? And secondly, how do we look at our education system and say, let's focus a lot more on making sure that people have got the right skills when they, when they graduate? And I mean, look, I'm the first one to say that's, a, that's not an easy thing to do because you're going back into a debate that's been underway in Ontario since the 1960s. 50s and 60s about how how quickly should we be encouraging people to to look at what their what their trade or what their vocation might be but I think it is an issue that we have to discuss and and we are the ones that have to discuss it it's not the feds we can't blame other governments we've got to look at ourselves and say how can we make sure this is something we're we're uh, we're paying attention to because it is taking too long to get people to have the skill sets to get into the into a lot of parts of the economy, and look at the white hair here, uh, you know there is a an overhang for the, for the baby boomers. Eventually, people are going to take take their place. As reluctant as some of us are to leave the stage, I mean the reality is it's it's uh, it's going to happen, right? <laughs> That's a comforting thought. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, you like it. <laughs> we can go arm in arm. <laughs> Tiff, you talked about um, entrepreneurship, and I, I must say I, I agree. I, it, 
you know, you only have to spend time listening to folks last night, and it's more than a generational change. It's an attitudinal difference when you see entrepreneurially driven and created kind of firms. Uh, you know, how do we go at this? I was down at Harvard three, four uh, weeks back, met with the, uh, the head of the Harvard Business School, and they actually are now pushing entrepreneurship as their number one issue at Harvard Business School and across Harvard. But the part that I thought was really important is they think it can be taught. It's not in the genes, which is one of our excuses sometimes. And they also think that, in a sense, everybody has the exceptional entrepreneur. How do you make entrepreneurship the, the average, required, versus kind of unique? So what do we do in Ontario, given our kind of education system, which with challenges is still pretty darn good and the institutions are pretty darn good, how do we actually turn that into a entrepreneurship rich culture? Thank you for the question. A couple of concrete ideas. First of all, it starts in high school. You talked about that. Uh, and two concrete ideas. Uh, first of all, uh, a lot of ventures come from more math, science, engineering. We've got to make sure we have world-class training in the STEM areas uh, in, in high school. And one area where Ontario high schools do not compare well is uh, is in the, the number of teachers who teach math and science that have a math and science major. We need to make sure we've got the very best teachers. That's, that's where you need to start. And just to give you a number, uh, it's coming out in the, uh, the Institute of Competitiveness and Prosperity report shortly. They compared Ontario teachers to a, a comparator group. And what they found is 19% of Ontario students were taught by a math teacher with a math major compared to 65% in comparator jurisdictions. In science, it's about 40% in Ontario compared to over 80% in comparator jurisdictions. This, we need more uh, teachers who are really excited and, and deeply knowledgeable. Um, then we also need to uh, build entrepreneurialism into the core high school curriculum. We've got to get people, uh, I agree entirely, there is a cultural way of coming. We've got to, we've got to, we've got to get in there uh, at their more, most formative stage. On the post-secondary front, I, I think a lot of it is about connect, doing a better job of connecting uh, science, math, computer science students with management expertise. As I said, we've got no lack of ideas. We've got lots of ideas, uh, but you know better than me. What does a business involve? Well, you need financing, you need operations, you need logistics, you need marketing, and you need sales. And you don't learn that in science. Uh, these scientists have great ideas, but if you want to translate it into sales, you've got to put those two things together, and, and that's certainly something where I think post-secondary uh, can really make a difference, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, it, is, it is very teachable. And then finally, um, I've got a business audience here. I'm not going to miss this opportunity. Um, businesses in, in Canada need to invest more in the skills of their workers. Uh, part of that is management training. Uh, as I said, we can teach, we can teach uh, managing innovation. Uh, and the other element is if you compare Canadian businesses to American businesses, uh, Canadian businesses um, hire fewer uh, people with advanced degrees, PhDs and masters in science and management. And the reality is better educated workers are more likely to innovate and they're more likely to develop new markets. Great, thank you. Craig, I'm going to turn to you next on the trade side. So TIFF raised the fact that we have to become more global. Some would say that Ontario is a trading province but not a province of traders. Uh, just a number for folks that the China growing at 6% puts as much demand in the global economy as the U.S. growing at 3% and China's growing faster than 6 and yet only 4% of our exports go to China. So in a sense, we're missing out on half of the growth engine in the global economy, which is not a really smart long-term strategy. So how do we change that? How do we not abandon our kind of uh, core base in the United States, but actually build on it uh, with markets elsewhere, Craig? Well, I think first, the recognition of the slow growth, strong growth. I mean, we're all too familiar with how, uh, how tightly intertwined we are with the, the US economy. So it's the, the, uh, the, the economy we know. 
I think it's uh, the path of least resistance. So when firms do think of exports, the first thought is maybe outside the province that they're in or outside of uh, Canada, and there it's mostly a U.S. story. Canada's at 75% of our exports go to the U.S. Ontario's a little bit higher than that, so we're even more uh, tilted towards the U.S. But U.S. growth the consensus are in and around growth of 3%. You had a couple points for inflation. You're looking at 5% growth in the market. So that's anything above that for business is a market share game, which is fairly difficult. So if you're looking at absolute growth, it does lie outside. And that's China, Southeast Asia. And as we go forward, they also face some challenges on a structural basis with the, the slowing in the labor force. But overall, it, that is where the focus has to be. And, and I think we're getting progress on that. I think, as I suggested earlier, that the, we, we should look at it through the lens of small, medium-sized enterprises because they are the Canadian business uh, economy. And I think there we don't do enough of that. So there, there's, there's trade missions, there's support, there's uh, trying to ease the, the uh, web of uh, government connections and, and support packages that are out there that SMEs maybe um, would find uh, helpful as they go forward. Um, but it's just supporting uh, a, a broader perspective for the small and medium-sized enterprises, which, as I said, are the growth driver and, uh, as of yet, are even on the low side of exports, not just the U.S., but the fast growth as well. Great. In fact, just to pick up the small and medium-sized enterprises, the Jobs and Prosperity Council that I was associated with, we did a, a study of the proportion of Ontario SMEs that do a single export outside of Canada in a year, and it was less than 10%. Uh, so that means 90% are actually trying to grow in an economy that needs growth stimulus from outside. The algebra doesn't work well. Uh, Ian, let me come back to you. Craig raised productivity. Productivity gaps in the manufacturing sector are large between us and the United States. How do we close them? Well, I, I think uh, one of the things we've, we've talked about is innovation. I think how do, how do we really embrace, uh, commercialize, and, and deal with innovation from a practical perspective? Uh, companies have been investing uh, more in updating their equipment, uh, updating their processes, but there's a lot more that, that has to be done on that. Uh, we've argued uh, successfully, I think, with the uh, uh, CCA to, to continue that. I think it's expected to expire in 2015. We like to see that incentive continue on because I think that's something that uh, recognizes and incents people to continue to invest in productivity improvements and continue to invest in innovation. But that's going to be the key to uh, our success in the future economy. We have to be innovative. We have to embrace. And we have to get uh, to uh, change some, some cultural and some attitudinal issues as well. It's uh, with regard to, uh, to education and skills, with regard to, uh, to global trade. I think people are looking uh, broader than they have in the past, but they still need tools. I think they need to be educated too on how they can access and take advantage of some of these uh, global marketplaces. They, they don't necessarily have that experience, so we have to educate them and provide them with the tools, again, through partnerships with, with government and other organizations, sharing best practices so that we can realize some, some definitive gains for, for global trade and for, and for innovation as well.